worship the Lord, we give Him all praise. We are no longer bound, no longer bound. You call me out of the grave, you call me into the light, you call my name, and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. shaking all the dead are coming back to life i'm back to life hear the song awaken all creation singing we're alive because you're alive you call me out of the grave you call me into the light you call my name and then my heart came alive your love is greater your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. And what a love we found, death can't hold us down. We shout it out, real life is your life. What a Shout it out, we're alive, cause you're alive. What a love we found, death can hold us down. We shout it out, we're alive, cause you're alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Amen. Praise God. It's because of his great love that he loved us even when we were dead in our sins. And he made us alive together with Christ. Let's praise God for his love for all people who believe in Christ's death and resurrection. we made alive forever with Christ. failures, 
for his love. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, Mount Pleasant Church. That was good singing. So whether you're, <laughs> hi Andrew, whether you're joining us online, we welcome you, uh, or whether you've chosen to gather here, uh, we worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 If you've been a part of Mount Pleasant for some time, you know the drill now. We have the connection cards in the seat in front of you, and they're a great way to sign up for events, contact info, share thoughts, ideas, and prayer requests with the office staff. If you're a guest, uh, grab one of those connection cards in the pew pocket in front of you, and when you're ready, we invite you to fill one out so we can, can get connected with you. Uh, you can just drop it off in one of the offering boxes on your way out uh, at the end of the service. Or you can also fill out the, the QR code on the back of the card and uh, connect with us there as well that way. Got a couple announcements here to share with you guys today. Be sure to read all of them in the e-program. Uh, if you're not already getting the e-program, make sure you sign up for that as well. Uh, it's a great way to keep up to date. Um, and the first one we want to share here is the Volunteer Appreciation Luncheon is next Sunday, April 14th, following the 11 o'clock service. Uh, this is for all volunteers in the ministry of our church. The menu is ham, chicken, anybody get enough ham? <laughs> ham, chicken, potatoes, green beans, macaroni and cheese, applesauce, rolls, and cake. Maybe the ham is like leftovers or something. I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm sure it's good. Hey, leftovers are good. Today's the last day to sign up, and you can uh, sign up by clicking on the link in the e-program or, again, use that connection card. We also have uh, child dedication coming up on Sunday, May 5th. If you'd like to dedicate your child and yourself to the Lord, please sign up by clicking on the link in the e-program again or on the connection card uh, by Sunday, April 21st. Game night. There's a game night coming up on April 20th. Lois, do you like games? Do you like games? Yeah. Okay, I thought you did. You're, you're a big gamer. <laughs> that has different meanings. <laughs> All right, 
I better stay on the script. Uh, Saturday, April 20th. Uh, from 6.30 to 8.30 in the gym, come out for a night of fun, games, laughter, and prizes for all ages. Uh, so that, I think, Sarah answers our question. I didn't notice that before. There was a question about, can we bring kids? And I think the answer is yes. It's for f four families, whoever's planning that. Thank you, Cheryl. Just in, yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes. The answer is yes. Bring the kids along. Uh, bring your favorite appetizer to share. Drink and dessert will be provided. Again, sign up in the e-program or on your connection card by next Sunday, April 14th. Um, all right, and also we have our offering today. As we give today, we just want to remind you of the words from Exodus 25:2. Tell the people of Israel to bring me their sacred offerings. Accept the contributions from all whose hearts are moved to offer them. If you've brought an offering today, you can drop it off in one of the offering boxes on your way out. Or if you prefer, you can give uh, through some other options, either online uh, or by going to our website or scanning that QR code again on the offering box. This one's on the offering box. But regardless of the size of your gift, thank you for investing in God's kingdom through the ministries of Mount Pleasant Church. Thank you very much. You guys like that, maybe we should do more announcements. <laughs> Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Well, God, we thank you for this time that we can all gather together, Lord, for a common goal, Lord, and that's to praise your holy name. And I pray that would be something that we would all be able to do today, that our hearts and our minds would be completely focused on you. And Lord, as we go throughout this time of worship, may it be something that affects us deeply, not just something that we participate in and then live the rest of our lives neglecting it, God, but let it be something that influences our decision every day and that everything that we say and do would be relying on you and we'd be pr bring praise to you, God. Please guide our steps, help your will to be done, and help us to always be in the midst of it. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We worship God who was and is and whoevermore is the same. He has all authority and victory over Satan, over the grave. He's conquered them forever. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Let us, let's all stand together and sing and shout with joy in the house of the Lord. Accepted, 
redeemed by his grace let the house of the lord sing praise because we were the beggars now we're royalty we were the prisoners now we're running free we are forgiven accepted redeemed by his grace let the house of the lord sing praise there's joy in the house of the lord there's joy in the house of the lord today we won't be quiet we shout out your praise there's joy in the house of the lord our god is surely in this place we won't be quiet we shout out your praise there's joy in the house of the lord there's joy in the house of the lord today we won't be quiet we shout out your praise there's joy in the house of the lord our god is surely in this place we won't be quiet we shout out your praise we shout out your praise praise the lord amen you may be seated kids you're coming this direction it's time for you to go to children's worship we want to pray for you before you go all right. Fantastic. All right. Hey, let's pray together. God, thank you for your presence among us. Thank you for the joy of children. And we ask that you would grant us the faith of children. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. See you guys. Off they go. All right. Hey, before I get to the sermon, I want to talk with you just a little bit about a thing called Royal Family Kids Camp. Danessa Grant. There he is. <laughs> uh, a couple of months ago, perhaps you recall, I preached a sermon addressing the issue of adoption and foster care. Uh, during that sermon, I made the statement we're not all called to do the same thing, but we, all are, but we are all called to do something. Well, that phrase had been rattling around in uh, some folks' hearts and minds over the last couple of weeks. And they came to me and said, did you ever hear about Royal Family Kids Camp? There's a need for people to help with it. Could we talk to the church about it? And I said, of course, absolutely. And so... Danessa and Grant are here to tell us a little bit more about Royal Family Kids Camp. Let's start with what is Royal Family Kids Camp? Yeah, so Royal Family Kids Camp is a faith-based organization made up of volunteers um, who have a heart to serve children and the Lord. Um, it's all about showing kids what a family structure is supposed to look like and treating them like royalty. Um, a lot of these kids come from not good home lives. Um, a lot of them are in the foster care system, um, and they just don't know um, how a family is supposed to look like. Um, so with our week, it's, just, it's a week of camp, um, and we have all different kinds of roles that you can do. Um, we have counselors, we have support staff, we have grandparents, um, we have Bible teachers, um, but everybody is working together to show the kids what a family structure is supposed to look like. Um, so during the week of camp, um, we teach kids about Jesus. Um, they have free time where they get to um, do like crayfishing, boating, canoeing, um, and whatever else they would like to do at the camp, um, they can do. Okay. <laughs> Now, you guys have been helping with Royal Family Kids Camp for some time. Yeah. Tell us, why do you choose to participate in Royal Family Kids Camp? Yeah, so the camp that we help with um, is located in Chambersburg, and it's, it started in 2015, so I've been helping ever since then. And every year that I've helped, um, there's something different that I've learned every single year. Um, the kids are always, they grow attached to you um, because we're all acting as a family, and so they are just not wanting to go home at the end of the week because we don't know what their home lives look like. Um, so 
it's it's very rewarding because like they love on you all week, but it's kind of also sad at the same time because you get to say like you're gonna have to say bye to them. You don't know what they're gonna go home to. So I like to do it because it's rewarding and the kids like you really do make a difference in their lives. <laughs> Guess this is my turn to share. <laughs> um, so I actually never heard of RFK until about two years ago when Vanessa and I started dating and I was like what is it and she said you know it's kids camp you you counselors and all that stuff and I was like hmm I'm not a big kids person I don't I don't do that I like more of the mission trips where I go and use my hands and everything so this was a uh, a huge I guess shock and big adjustment um, so for the people out there just like me uh, definitely do it uh, it's actually a lot more fun than what you think it could be um, and it's really not that bad once you get there. Uh, I mean, <laughs> it really isn't. I was terrified. <laughs> You're not in sales, are you? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. No, not. Um, but last year, I had uh, I was playing basketball there, and I sprained my ankle, and um, and it was really hard for me because I like to not be sitting around and being do, being able to do something so it was really hard for me and the campers could definitely tell and even they uh, were uplifting me and to see that you know if you're pouring into the campers and they see that and then they see you kind of like what I went through they poured right back into me and that was you know that was very I don't know humbling and just it was definitely eye-opening for me and it's like you know I go through the same thing every year I'm like I don't know if I want to do it because I go through the same thing I don't I'm not the greatest with kids, but then when I get there and I do it and afterwards I'm like, you know, this is why I like to do it. It's, it's really rewarding to be able to pour into the kids and in turn they go out and then they might pour into somebody else as well because you poured into them. And I understand that there are roles for people, whether it's just I can give one night all the way up to I can give a week, yeah. from I could be a nurse to I can throw a water balloon. Yeah. There's like <laughs> all of that. Yeah. There's space. So there's different, um, we say, like, evening activities or, like, daytime activities. Um, so Pam Osbo and her husband, um, they came up and they did a water slide with the kids um, just for one day. I, sl I slid the furthest. I just want to yeah. say that. <laughs> yeah. um, so even if you can't do the whole week, there's other opportunities um, for you there. Great. And if people wanted to know more about Royal Family Kids Camp and how they might consider being connected, what should they do? Yeah, so on April 21st, um, we're going to have our directors here, um, Tom and Angie Black, and they're going to come um, after the 11 o'clock service and kind of, who's ever interested, um, just share a little bit more about it. If you have any questions, um, they'll be here to answer those as well. Um, and then you can always just come to myself, Grant, or Pam Osball. Fantastic. Thanks so much. Yeah. Appreciate it. Well, it's the Sunday after Easter. Last Sunday, we were all filled with energy, excitement, and enthusiasm. The, the difficult journey of Lent had come to an end. The stone was rolled away. The tomb was empty. Easter Day is exciting. We love Easter Day. We love Easter Day so much that more than a hundred of us showed up at 6.30 a.m. and sat outside in the cold to hear the same story we were going to hear three hours later in the comfort of the sanctuary. We love Easter Day. The Sunday after Easter? Not so much. There was nobody sitting outside in the cold at 6.30 this morning. Nor would you have, <laughs> not on the Sunday after Easter. But what if we took a more ancient approach? You see, in the ancient church, Easter wasn't so much a day as it was a season. Yes, on Easter Day, our spiritual ancestors gathered to celebrate the resurrection, but Easter Day was the first day of a season stretching weeks forward. A season in which we celebrate 
things which the resurrection makes possible. So, what if we took a more ancient approach to Easter? What if, if a, instead of just packing away our decorations and hanging on for Memorial Day, which is a long time from now, what if instead of that, we just took a more ancient approach and, and practiced the season of Easter? Exploring and experiencing the power of the resurrection in our lives. Well, this morning we're launching a new series in which we'll be learning some lessons from the early church. And we'll be exploring some passages from the book of Acts. Now, if you're not familiar with the book of Acts, Acts is essentially a sequel. It's a sequel to the Gospel of Luke. In the book of Acts, we get the story of how, of how the church grew from this little group of Jewish people locked behind closed doors to spreading across the entire Roman Empire. The book of Acts gives us glimpses into what some of Jesus' first followers were doing and experiencing in those weeks and months after Jesus' resurrection. If you have a Bible with you, I invite you to join me at Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. And as you get there, let me describe, if I can, at least a bit of the cultural background of the ancient world, uh, the first century. You see, like, like our modern culture, the culture of the first century was characterized by division. It was divi divided, it was a, a, a culture of groups, it was a culture of greed, it was a culture of guilt. For example, the ancient world was divided politically. Uh, you had the pro-Rome group and the anti-Rome group. But even amongst the anti-Romers, that might be the first time that phrase had ever been used, <laughs> even against those who were opposed to Rome, the Jews, even there was huge disagreement politically amongst Jewish people. The, the perspectives amongst Jewish people are all those who were opposed to Rome ranged everywhere from appeasement to separation to violent revolution. Even within Jesus' original 12, there were great disagreements along political lines on how to deal with the Roman problem. So the world of the first century was one of political division. It was also a world that was divided racially. Essentially, there were two races, Jews and Gentiles. Uh, Jews were the descendants of Abraham, God's chosen people. Gentiles were everybody else. And they did not get along. Jews looked at Gentiles as, well, you're not chosen, not like us. Meanwhile, Gentiles looked at Jews as dogs. The idea of anti-Semitism is not a modern invention. Simply put, the two just did not mix. The ancient world was also divided along socioeconomic lines. The vast majority of people in the ancient world owned little more than the one set of clothes that they were currently wearing. They lived day to day, very much in need of God providing their daily bread. There were no social service safety nets. And even those who owned some land often found themselves so upside down in debt that they had to sell themselves as slaves. As you imagine, 
Slaves and slave owners don't exactly mix socially. The ancient world was divided socioeconomically. The ancient world was also divided by gender. Men and women didn't mix. For that matter, women weren't even seen as people. And anybody who was experiencing gender dysphoria or was born intersex, they, they were seen as being unclean people. Their medical and psychological suffering being written off as the result of somebody's sin, either theirs or more than likely their parents'. So unless you were a Jewish man of great wealth, you had no voice in the ancient world. You lived your days trying to survive. Like our modern culture, the culture of the first century was driven by groups, by greed, by guilt. But the power of the resurrection transformed God's people into a community of grace. Let me show you. Acts chapter 4, beginning at verse 32. All the believers were united in heart and mind, and they felt that what they owned was not their own. So they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's great blessing was upon them all. There were no needy people among them, because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. Oh, here at the beginning of the book of Acts, in the first few chapters, Luke describes the state of affairs within the Christian community, calling attention to a few important things for us to notice. For one, the early church was a unified community. Now that doesn't mean that they all agreed on everything. But they realized that what they held in common was far more important than any of the various ways the culture tries to divide people. Their shared identity in Christ was more important than politics or money or gender or anything else. And that brought a unity that was genuine and deep. Scripture describes it as being of one heart and mind. It's a unity that shaped their behavior. Luke tells us that the Christian community shared their possessions. Rather than acting on greed or guilt, which have always been significant motivators in, in human culture, our spiritual ancestors believed deeply that what they owned was purely a gift from God. So how can I hold tight-fistedly something that's never really been mine? That it's just God's property put in my hand. They gladly gave what they had to meet the needs of the community. And because of that, Luke tells us that all the needs of the Christian community were met. Now please understand... Luke is not promoting Christian communism. None of this was coerced. None of this was forced in any way. In fact, in the very next chapter in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 5, we come across a tragic scene in which Ananias and Sapphira try to look generous while actually being quite greedy. No, Luke is not prescribing an economic or political philosophy. He's making a point. You see, in both a Jewish and a Gentile mentality, 
the ideal community was one that was characterized by generosity and unity. And that's how Luke describes the church at the beginning of Acts. Oh, this idea that there would be unity and generosity, boy, that, that's always appealed to humanity, hasn't it? And, and we've, stri- we've, we've strived in many ways to make that happen. Insert the 60s. And yet it's always fell apart because it's all dependent on human activity. Not so in the church. For the unity and the generosity that existed in the church was fueled not by human desire, but by the power of the resurrection. And that enabled a third element of the life in the early church. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's great blessing was upon them all. Oh, the witness of the first church included both words and behavior. They proclaimed the good news of Jesus Christ boldly, and then their lives served as an example of the power of the resurrection. Oh, while the culture of the first century was one of groups and greed and guilt, the power of the resurrection transformed God's people into a community of grace. And as I've been reflecting on the passage, I've I've come to a couple of realizations. For one, the first church, the first Christians, they were not better than us. They're just like us. Like all humans, Our ancient ancestors of faith were limited in their understanding and their abilities. Like all humans trying to live in community, their efforts to live and serve together didn't always go well. Keep reading the book of Acts. You'll discover that. And that's really helpful for us to understand because we aren't perfect either just like them. We can relate to the practical challenges that always arise when humans try to human together. Practicing the one another's of Scripture, that's always been really hard. It still is. It always will be. But I've also realized that God's word still calls us to pursue a community that lives with one heart and mind. That doesn't mean that we have to agree on everything. I mean, I suppose if you had to root for the Yankees or the Cowboys, (sighs) we don't have to agree on everything. It doesn't mean that we have to all look the same or think the same, or have the same perspective on every subject. Unity is not uniformity. Instead, unity requires that we choose to come together, deciding that there's this one thing that is more important than any other thing. That although we'll disagree about a vast, ma- a vast majority of things, perhaps, there's this one thing that pulls us together that's more important than, it, than all of it. The question is, what's that one thing? Well, my friends, it's not the power of politics. For most of my life, Christians have been used and abused like pawns on a chessboard by political power brokers interested in nothing more than winning elections. And we fall for it over and over and over again. We've been told that the, sol- the, pro- the solution to the problems that our country faces is to hold our nose and 
vote against the worst of two evils. And the result? A church in which the statement is made, you can't be a Christian and vote for that party. I grieve for the way we as a church have allowed ourselves to be divided on political lines. Saying all sorts of ungodly things behind people's backs about people simply because we disagree about a political question. Now, We find ourselves in a place in which the leader of one political party celebrates the International Transgender Day of Visibility on Easter Day. And the leader of the other is out peddling Bibles to raise money, trying to convince us that the Bible is his favorite book when all the evidence shouts the opposite. How long will we buy the lie? How long will we allow ourselves to be divided in the church over the question of politics? Politics has never been the answer. It never will be the answer. And economics isn't the answer. And education isn't the answer. And philosophy isn't the answer nor is any other human construction the answer to living in community with one heart and one mind. God's call for us to live in unity that leads to generosity is the same today as it was in the first century. And the road to get there is also the same. In a culture of groups and greed and guilt, the power of the resurrection still transforms God's people into a community of grace. Because of the power of the resurrection, there is no such thing as racial division in the church. There's no such thing as gender division in the church. There's no such thing as economic division in the church. There's no such thing as political divisions in the church. There's no such thing as any division in the church. For the church is the single body of Christ with Christ as our head and all of us being essential parts. Amen? Amen. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. We are all sinners created with the same divine imprint, struggling with the brokenness of our sin nature, yet saved by grace. This is our identity. This is what brings us together, despite all the things we may disagree about. This is the road to being a community of diverse people who live with one heart, And one mind. You see, if we'll allow who we are in Christ to become our true identity, then that reality will transform the way we live. We'll become people of one heart and one mind, characterized by love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self control. And you know how the world will look at us? Like we're nuts. Because that's not the way the world works. And we say, that's okay, because this world is not our home. Our citizenship is not to a nation on this earth. Our citizenship is to the kingdom of heaven. And that is what draws us together. That is what holds us together. And oh, the witness, the testimony that that kind of living would have in our world today. 
people would look at us and say, why are you so different? (laughs) I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you about Jesus. Because in myself, I'm not loving. I'm not joyful. I'm not peaceful. I'm not patient. I'm not gentle. And I certainly struggle with self-control. But through the power of the resurrection, all of that fruit is welling up in me. All of that fruit is welling up in you. Oh, brothers and sisters, the power of the resurrection still pulls very different people together into a unity that expresses itself in living of one heart and one mind. So as our worship team comes back to the platform, I want to lead you in a time of reflection, in a time of confession and a time of prayer. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you some questions and then I'm going to pause to simply allow you to consider. The first of them is this. What identity have you allowed to become more important than your identity in Christ that's causing you to look down on a fellow follower of Christ? Is it politics? Is it economics? Is it race? Is it immigration status? Is it gender? Essentially what I'm asking is, what are you allowing to cause division that needs to be overcome through the power of the resurrection? Think on that a spell. Let me give you another area. What possessions are you holding on to in a greedy, tight fisted manner? Is it your time? Is it your abilities? Is it your finances? Or another way to ask the question what craving are you feeding that needs to be overcome through the power of the resurrection? Think on that a spell. One last area. What are you doing that the only reason you're doing that is because you feel guilty? My friends, Jesus has already paid the full price for your sin. It's time to forgive yourself. So for what do you need to forgive yourself through the power of the resurrection? During this next song, I invite you to continue reflecting about what you're hearing God speak to your soul about. Maybe by now you've got a laundry list of things to talk with him about. Maybe there's that one thing that you need to talk with him about. Whatever it is, I invite you to continue reflecting and confessing and receiving forgiveness for your sin and healing for your soul. If you curse me, then I will bless you. If you hurt me, I will forgive. And if you hate me, then I will love you. I choose the Jesus way. If you're helpless, I will defend you. And if you're burdened, I'll share the weight. And 
If you're hopeless, then let me show you there is hope in the Jesus way. I follow Jesus, I follow Jesus, He wore my sin now, gladly wear His name, He is the treasure, He is the answer, oh I choose the Jesus way. strike me I will embrace you and if you chain me I'll sing his praise and if you kill me my home is heaven for I choose a Jesus way I follow Jesus I follow first to struggle to always choose the Jesus way because he's the only one who's perfect but we strive to to follow him to to live according to him Ephesians 3:16 says that from his glorious unlimited resources he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit praise God let's stand together as we we sing of his power to his salvation to your power There is no stopping what you plan You give us faith to move the mountains and hope to dream again We see the fires of revival The darkness giving way to light Glory of the grace of dancing, let it burn up the night, let it burn up the night, let the walls come down in Jesus' name, let the lost be found in Jesus' name, let the church arise to shine your light to the world, shine your light, your house forever. 
your sons and daughters one At the cross we are united Our hope is in the blood Our hope is in the blood Let the walls come down In Jesus' name Let the lost be found In Jesus' name Let the church arise To shine your light to the world Shine your light Open eyes to see In Jesus' name Let the city sing Jesus' name, let the church arise to shine your light to the world, shine your light. Salvation's tide is rising. As all your people seek your face, your life a river flowing to wash our sin and shame away. Salvation's tide is rising as all your people seek your face, your life a river flowing. Our sin and shame away. Salvation's tide is rising as all your people seek your face. Your life, a river flowing to wash our sin and shame away. Let the walls come. Let the lost be found in Jesus' name. Let the church arise to shine your light to the world. Shine your light. Open eyes to see in Jesus' name. Let the city see in Jesus' name. Let the church arise to shine your light. Thank you for joining us for worship today. As we close, I want to remind you of something you already know, but it never hurts to hear again. God loves you unconditionally. Warts and all. Isn't that good news? Because we've all got warts. Ain't none of us is perfect. We're still in process. And God loves us anyway. Hmm. And I love you too. So if I can be of any help to you, uh, if you need someone to pray with, if you want someone to talk to, I'm, I'm going to be hanging out off to the side here. Pastor Heath, Pastor Bobby, Pastor Mark, we're all around. We're happy to, to chat with you if you'd like to spend some time today. But until I see you again, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And God's people said, Amen. God bless you. Go in his peace. Let the walls come down in Jesus' name. Let the walls be found in Jesus' name. Let the church arise to shine your light to the world. Shine your light. Open eyes to see in Jesus' name. Let the sin.